Okay, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 12. It's where we left off last time. It wasn't really a natural uh, cutoff point, but the clock decided for us that it was time to cut off, and we, uh, you know, we're really kind of in the middle of a thought. So it perhaps it's good for me to go back to verse 10 to pick up the context. Uh, John said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, which, as we said, has been rendered differently by some different people, but seems to be the preferred translation. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw the seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were like white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like, a fine, bra like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. All right. Now, occasionally in the book of Revelation, though not often enough, after a vision is seen, there is an explanation given of the symbols. This is one of the very few places that's the case in verse 20. We have the vision described first, and one of the first things that John sees when he turns around is the golden lampstands. Then he sees this personage, and among the features described of that personage are he had seven stars in his right hand. And so uh, by the end of the chapter, he tells us what the lampstands represent and what the stars represent. The rest of the description, we're sort of on our own to figure out what is represented by those things. Another place where this is done is in chapter 17, where he sees the vision of the harlot riding on the beast, and, and then the angel explains what this, what this means and who it is. <coughs> As I said, this doesn't happen quite often enough in the book of Revelation. And even sometimes, the explanation is not much easier to understand than the mystery that's being explained. For example, when he says, well, the seven stars, you wonder what those are? I'll tell you, it's the seven angels of the seven churches. But that's not all that helpful because nobody really is sure what is meant by the seven angels of the seven churches. Some believe that they represent um, guardian angels that are over individual churches. Um, there is some suggestion that individuals have guardian angels in the Bible. And some feel that there are also angels perhaps of a higher rank or whatever that are over individual churches or towns or countries. Um, and that is a possibility. However, to suggest that the angels of the churches really are angelic beings, that is, superhuman heavenly beings, creates one difficulty, and that is when you read the letters to the seven churches, which occupies chapters 2 and 3, each letter is addressed to the angel of the church. And if the angel of the church is in fact some heavenly being, some invisible being, some person who without the church even knowing of his presence is somehow guarding over the church, it's hard to know, first of all, why the angel would be accused of the things which some of these are accused of. Why would the angel be held responsible? And secondly, if these letters were addressed to the angel, how was the message supposed to be conveyed from the angel to the persons in the church? Since presumably, if we're talking about guardian angels, these angels do not have regular communication with the persons they're guarding. And so it, it would seem strange to address the letters, as he does, to angels, if the angels refers to heavenly beings, invisible, supernatural, angelic creatures, people, you know, angelic people. Um, the, the word angels, as I pointed out before, is a, in the word just a, an ordinary word for messengers. And while it is used of heavenly angels, it is used otherwise in the Bible. And uh, a person, even Jesus, is called an angelos, 
on occasions, or an angel, which in that case simply means messenger, uh, and other human beings are spoken of as, as angelos, as angels or messengers. Uh, so it is more common, it seems to me, for commentators to suggest that the angels of the seven churches are the messengers or the human leaders of the churches. Now this would suggest, however, that the churches at this point in history had individual leaders at their head. And that does not seem to accord well with what is known of the church in the first century, whether it was during the reign of Nero or Domitian that this was written. It still is not believed that the idea of a single pastor or a single bishop over a church had developed as early as the first century. In the second century, the church structure had developed to a point where there were bishops over individual churches. Bishop in the Bible, of course, is interchangeable with the word elder. And in the New Testament times, it would appear that the churches were governed by a board of elders or by a group of elders. You never read of an individual leader of a church, an individual pastor or elder or bishop in the Bible. But you do read of elders, plural, of the church, singular, of any given church. So it seemed like churches in the first century were governed not by individual leaders, but by a group of leaders. That would not prevent, however, the possibility that one of these leaders would be more of the spokesman for the group or have more of the preaching gift or even just be delegated uh, with the duty of the public reading of the scriptures in the church. Um, the fact that there might be a number of elders doesn't mean that there wouldn't be one person in a given church who was the one who most frequently spoke to the church publicly, as is the case in many churches. In fact, many of the churches that I've been part of have had boards of elders, and the, the pastor is essentially considered one of the elders, but he speaks more often than the others do in the pulpit. And that may well have been so in the other church. We find, for instance, in the church of Jerusalem, when the elders and apostles gathered, that James seems to have spoken up on behalf of the group. And also later on, when Paul visited Jerusalem, it seems that James spoke on behalf of the church. Uh, though he was not the pastor, he was one of the apostles or elders of the church, but he seems to have been the one that was deferred to a great deal. Likewise, Peter, earlier, among the apostles. He was only an apostle like the other apostles were, but he seems to have been the one who always spoke up on behalf of the apostles. And it may have been the same in churches. It, I think it is likely, although we don't read in the Bible of some structure in the early church that allowed for one person to be the principal messenger to the church or the principal leader of the church. Yet I know from my own experience that even in churches where one, where there's a group of elders that are all equal in authority, still they're not all equally outspoken or equally visible or equally public in their ministry, and that was probably the case. And so we, it's probably safest to suggest that the, the stars, the seven stars represent human leaders, human spokesmen, who would give the message from Jesus, here written in these letters, to the congregation. In support of this, uh, we could suggest that the book of Daniel has some parallel uh, language, of course, and that has been observed by everybody who's read both books. And in Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> no, chapter 8, in verse 10, speaking of Antiochus Epiphanes, it says, And it grew up, the horn, to the host of heaven, usually a reference to the stars. And it cast some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. Now this really, if we look back at the history of Antiochus Epiphanes, this could only be a reference to the fact that he cast down many righteous people. And in chapter 11, where it's also talking of Daniel, where it's also talking about Antiochus's activities, it's, it's more specific that it is people that suffer at his hands. Uh, because it says in verse 32, those who do wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with, he shall corrupt with flattery, but the people that know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits, and those of the people who understand shall instruct many for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame and by captivity and plundering. Now that is a reference to the godly people being killed by Antiochus Epiphanes. Whereas in chapter 8 they are symbolically said to be stars cast to the ground. Also in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3 it says those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So that, again, righteous people are said to be like the stars. So when we turn to Revelation, 
and we find stars, symbolic of something. Uh, if, if there is a reasonable suggestion that they could be people, this would agree with Daniel's use of that image. And by the way, of course, uh, in, De in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 3, or verse 4, it says of the dragon in Revelation 12, 4, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Very similar to what is said about Antiochus Epiphanes in, in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 10. So, probably a reference to his persecuting and, and killing off the saints. Only a third of them, a significant minority, because not all the saints ever were killed, but a very significant minority often were in times of intense persecution. So, I I lean toward the view that the stars represent people, both in Daniel and in Revelation, and uh, in this case, probably human messengers to the churches who would be the logical persons to send these letters to. If Jesus had something to say to the church, and there was somebody who regularly spoke to the gathered church, then to address the letter to that person would be a sensible thing to do. Okay, we've talked about verse 20, but we haven't talked about the verses that it is explaining. In verse 10, he heard the voice. In verse 12, he turned to see the voice that spoke to him. Now, we know that who spoke to him was Jesus. That becomes clear in the following verses. But the first thing he sees, or at least the first thing he describes, when he turns to see who spoke, is not Jesus, but the golden lampstands that represent the churches. And he sees Jesus among the churches. And I don't know how significant this is intended to be, but it seems interesting that John wished to turn to see the one who was speaking. And he found him among the churches. He saw the churches before he saw the person. And we could suggest that this is the place where we will generally find Christ and also hear him speak, is in the church. Now, not to say he wouldn't speak to you when you're in a private place too. But the fact of the matter is that Jesus has chosen to manifest himself through his people and through his gathered people in particular. Because there is a corporate expression of Christ where, where people gather. That's why Jesus said, where two or more are gathered, and there am I in the midst of them. When there is a corporate gathering, there is a corporate expression of Christ in the form of his body. Now, I'm not saying that this is intended to teach that fact. I don't know that it is or isn't. I just find it interesting that he, like John, like, like you or I, wishing to see the one who's speaking to, or to hear the voice of Christ, uh, when he turns around, he sees before he sees Christ, he sees the church. And within the church, he sees Jesus. Or among the churches, he sees Jesus. And um, so he sees the golden lampstands. Now, in the, in the tabernacle of the Old Testament, there was a lampstand that had seven branches. And this reference to seven lampstands, especially with reference to seven golden lampstands, and the one in the tabernacle was golden, probably is intended to call our attention back to the lampstand of the tabernacle. Uh, it appears, however, these were individual lampstands, not connected at, at a base like the golden lampstand in the temple was, but we can't be sure of that. The language, I suppose, could allow that they were seven branches of one lampstand, but it sounds like seven different lampstands. Yet the imagery is close enough to, to seemingly turn our attention back to the tabernacle and when we talked about the tabernacle, we pointed out that, in my opinion, based on this very chapter, the lampstands do represent the church as the light of the world. When this is later described, um, the churches are the lampstands, and they, the seven stars, or the seven messengers to the churches, stars and lampstands both have the same function, that is to, con to carry light, uh, to be light bearers. The stars, however, do this in the heavens, and the lampstand does this on the earth. And so this seems to speak of both the earthly and the, and the heavenly witness of the church, or the light-bearing function of the church. Now, we know what the earthly light-bearing function of the church is. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Uh, we are to bring light to the world around us. But what is, the, what, what is meant by the heavenly uh, light-bearing, like the stars? Well, of course, we know that when God created the stars in Genesis chapter 1, we're told that he did it to give light on the earth. So they, too, bear light to the earth. It just happens that they do so from a, a position in the heavens. The earth and the heavens are both the abodes of the church. On the one hand, some of the church is still on the earth, and some has already gone to heaven. 
Seen another way, even the living church has an existence both in heaven and on earth. Because it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 that Christ has caused us to be seated, or God has caused us to be seated in Christ in heavenly places with God. And uh, so we are, in one sense, seated in the heavenlies in Christ. But we also have an existence on the earth in bo from both positions. We are to give light on the earth. The lampstands give light on the earth, and the stars give light on the earth. Uh, so both of these aspects of the witness of the church seems to be signified by the mention of, by the use of these symbols of stars and lampstands. Uh, in the midst of the seven lampstands, verse 13, begins the description, one like the Son of Man. Now it's interesting to think of what John means by that expression. Because the expression, one, one like the Son of Man, is an expression taken directly from Daniel 7.13. Where it says, I saw one like the Son of Man. And that's the expression that's used in Daniel 7.13. In that context, though, Son of Man had a generic meaning. One like a human being. And in the Old Testament, that is usually the way that the term Son of Man is used. In the poetry of the Psalms and Proverbs, usually Son of Man is used in the parallel clause to the word man. In the poetry of the Hebrew, where there's the same thing is said twice in two clauses. In the Psalms and the Proverbs, and many times in the Prophets, the, clause, the first clause will use the term man, and the second clause, in the same position, will use the term son of man, as if just to say a human being. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Psalm 8 says. Just two ways of saying the same thing. The Son of Man just means a human. And Daniel 7, 13, where it says, I saw one like the Son of Man, is in contrast to, I saw a beast like a lion, I saw a beast like a bear, and a third one like a leopard, and another one like something else. And then I saw someone like a human, one like the Son of Man. Now, it so happens that in Daniel, that particular one like the Son of Man that he saw was Christ. And so, Revelation also uses the same expression, speaking apparently of Christ, says, I saw one like the Son of Man, using the exact expression Daniel used. But as I said, the Son of Man was sort of a generic uh, term for human in Daniel, although it symbolized Christ. He used it in the Old Testament sense of, I saw a human person. I saw one like a human, as opposed to one like a bear or a lion or a leopard earlier. Now, John, however, in writing this, would have known far more about the term Son of Man than Daniel did. In the Old Testament, we don't ever find a time when the term Son of Man was a technical term for the Messiah. In fact, the only time in the Old Testament where the term Son of Man is even used for the Messiah is in Daniel 7.13, and even there it's not a technical term for him. It's not a title there. It's just one like the Son of Man. But by the time John wrote this, it had become very much a, a technical term, a title for the Messiah, because that's the favorite term Jesus used in speaking of himself. In the Gospels, over... Over 70 times, Jesus used the term Son of Man speaking to himself. So while John uses the language of exactly taken from Daniel, the term Son of Man, is, as John uses it, had far more significance to him than it probably did to Daniel. And uh, John would have a lot more, uh, more information standing behind that title than Daniel did. But in saying one like the Son of Man, and using a term from Daniel, it's interesting, it goes on and describes a personage that resembles a person in Daniel. Now, do you think that when you see Jesus, he'll look like this? I don't know if you will or not. I frankly don't think so. I don't, some people think that what, what uh, John saw here is just the way Jesus looks and the way he'll look when we see him again. After all, one of the features here is that he has a sword coming out of his mouth, and later on in chapter 19... He sees Jesus on a white horse and there's a sword coming out of his mouth, so that's a characteristic of both descriptions. And maybe they, someone would think that's exactly what he'll really look like. The only thing is that that's not the only way Jesus is described in the book of Revelation. More often he's described looking like a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. And I don't think any of us expect when Jesus comes back to see him looking like a lamb with seven eyes and seven horns. We recognize that as a symbolic way of describing him. And I think it's very likely that this too is a symbolic way. Now, John saw this, but he saw it when he was in the spirit, possibly in a trance. He was shown a vision, just like Daniel saw visions of bears and lions and leopards. And yet the bears and lions and leopards saw weren't real bears, lions and leopards. They were symbolic of empires. 
so that when a person is in the spirit seeing visions, it's very possible that those visions will depict literal truths in symbolic form. And I think that the description of Christ, or the form in which Christ appeared on the island of Patmos to John, is not necessarily the way he will literally look. I'd be very surprised if when I see Jesus there's a literal steel two-edged sword hanging out of his mouth. That would seem rather to be symbolic for his word, which is like a two-edged sword. And since the sword is proceeding out of his mouth, it seems very likely to confirm the notion that this is speaking of the sharpness of his word and the power of his word as a weapon against the forces of darkness. Later on, he warns one of the churches. He says, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and make war with you with, with using the sword that proceeds out of my mouth. He says that to the church of Pergamos, I believe. Uh, yes, verse 16 of chapter 2. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and I will fight uh, against them with the sword of my mouth. So the idea of the sword coming out of his mouth, I believe, is to convey the notion that his word, like a weapon, serves to defeat his enemies. Later on in chapter 19, when he's, he's seen on the white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth, it says, with it, that is with the sword that proceeded out of his mouth, he smote the nations, which suggests to me his conquering of the nations with the word that proceeded out of his mouth. And all the things about this description of Christ can be seen to have symbolic value. Now, if we actually see Jesus and he looks like this, that's okay. Although I'm going to duck if he turns his head my way. I assume the sword moves when he moves, you know. But uh, I, really, I really don't honestly think that uh, this is a literal description of Christ, but rather a symbolic one. Then we, of course, would ask, well, what is the symbolic meaning? Well, he's clothed with a garment down to the feet. This is not the ordinary way for a man to dress, but it was the way the priests dressed. Uh, maybe that some, other than priests, on festal occasions may have worn such long robes, but it was not the ordinary dress because it would be, it'd be a hindrance to ordinary life and work for a man to wear such long skirts down to, the, the, down to his feet. Usually, I'm sure their, their skirts were only about knee length or so, and even then, they had to be bound up behind them um, in order to do serious work. But he is probably depicted here in a priestly robe, uh, suggesting his priesthood. It's not stated plainly, but later on we do read of the uh, 24 elders who also are wearing what are described apparently as uh, a priestly garment, uh, long robes and so forth, and probably that is, uh, that is likely to be what this is supposed to mean. Uh, they are wearing white robes. If you look at, for instance, chapter 5 and verse 8. Um, no, that's not where it talks about their robes. Where does it show, mention their robes first? Um, mm -hmm. four, four. 24, let's see, around the throne were 24 thrones. On the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. Okay. And they had crowns of gold on their heads, seemingly having the mixed imagery of a of uh, royalty and priesthood. Crowns suggest royalty, the robes probably priesthood. Also, these same 24 elders offer incense like the priests did a little later on in the book. So the white robe uh, probably is a, a reference to the priestly robe and speaks of the priesthood of Christ. We also see that he's girded about the chest with a golden, the King James says girdle, uh, this would ordinarily be a, a, a cloth sash that was tied around the waist, and it was used usually during, when, when work was being done, it was used to bind up the, the excessive material of the skirts of the garment to get the legs freed up to move without hindrance. But the interesting thing is his girdle is not around his waist, the normal place where people would wear it. It's around his chest which suggests possibly, and this is what some commentators believe to be the case, that it, it's suggesting that his work is complete. If he were at work, he'd, have his, his, he'd be using his girdle around his waist to bind up his garments for, for the work day. The suggestion that he's taken his girdle off his garments, he's thrown it over his shoulder, and he's on his way maybe in from the fields would be the imagery. He's finished with the, with the day's work. He's, uh, the, the girdle around his chest rather than around his waist may suggest that uh, his work is complete as a priest. Uh, this would, of course, duplicate some of the things that the book of Hebrews says uh, 
although only symbolically here. Hebrews alone really describes the finished work of Christ as a priestly work in plain terms, but this, this imagery could point the same direction. It says his head and his hair were white like wool, which in Hebrew thinking would be a sign of honor, possibly wisdom. Age, of course, is what is implied here. He's the ancient of days. He's been around a long time. And uh, therefore, the white hair ordinarily would speak of age and therefore the experience and wisdom and honor that would be associated with age. It says in Proverbs that the white hair is a crown of glory if it's received in the way of righteousness. His eyes are like a flame of fire, which, although this requires a little bit of guessing, it seems like a fair guess to suggest that his eyes are, are therefore said to be penetrating. His gaze is a penetrating gaze, like fire. It burns through all the masks. It burns through all the uh, false fronts that we put up. His, it's maybe in modern times it might be compared with laser beams instead of fire. Uh, his feet like fine brass. What is the significance of his feet? Well, uh, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is that feet are for walking, but I don't know that that would be the intended meaning here. There is a special function of his feet, referred to later in Revelation and also earlier in the book of Isaiah, that I think likely to be what is in, in view here. If you look at Isaiah 63, a messianic passage about Christ, beginning with verse 1, it says, Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. The answer, I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Question, why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? Answer, I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help. I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, and made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. So the judgment executed by Christ is depicted in the form of treading the winepress, which ordinarily produced wine, but in this case it produced blood. His garments are stained with the blood of those who have been trampling. Now, later in Revelation, the exact image from Isaiah 63 is used <clears throat> in chapter 14 of Revelation. Verse 19 and 20 says, So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city. And blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So again, here's a wine press that produces not wine but blood, just like in, in Isaiah 63. That's probably where the imagery comes from. But in Isaiah 63, it's Christ who's doing the treading. That's not specified in Revelation 14. It just says the wine press was trodden. It doesn't say who's doing the treading. But in Isaiah 63, it's the Messiah himself who's treading the wine press of his enemies. Now, that, I think, is likely to be the meaning of his feet of bronze or brass. Brass would be a very strong metal in those times, one of the strongest metals they knew, and therefore unbreakable or irresistible. His feet are for treading the winepress of wrath, that is, for judgment. And his judgment, therefore, would be seen to be strong and irresistible. When he determines to come and tread, nothing's going to stop him. Nothing's going to break his feet or prevent them from crushing what they have come to trample. And if this is a book that seems to forewarn of judgment from Christ, and it certainly appears to be that, since we read of the wrath of the Lamb and so forth in the book frequently, then the notion that his feet were like brass probably is to convey the idea that when he comes to trample, uh, he's got strong feet, and uh, in his judgment it cannot be survived by those who are his victims. The next item, it says in verse 15, his voice was as the sound of many waters. Perhaps the idea of uh, ocean waves or maybe the uh, cascading waterfall, the crashing sound of waters. His voice is like that. Now this is a, an image that's taken from the Old Testament. Uh, 
both from the passage in Daniel, where most of this imagery comes from, also Ezekiel used the figure of the voice that sounded like many waters. I don't really know exactly how to understand that. Later on, the many waters represent nations, kingdoms, and tribes, and so forth. Uh, it says that in chapter 17, verse 15. Chapter 17, 15 says, And he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Now, I've told you before that whereas the land often is a symbol for Israel, the sea is sometimes a symbol for the Gentiles. It would certainly seem to be the case in that verse we just read in Revelation 17, 15. Uh, maybe that's meant here too. Maybe his voice is not usually heard directly from his mouth, but through, through his people of many nations, through, through his church, which is found in many countries or all over the world. But I'm not sure I'd want to press that. It may simply mean that his voice is a majestic and intimidating voice. If you stand right near to something that's very loud, whether you're standing right near the tracks when the train goes by and that, that incessant rumbling, you know, it eventually kind of unnerves you a little bit. Or standing by a crashing waterfall, it can, you know, if it's really an overwhelmingly loud sound, it can kind of make you tremble. It can, it can unnerve you. I don't know if that's what's intended here or not. I know the imagery is taken from the Old Testament, and therefore it's not simply Christ, but apparently other messengers of God have had voices that were like the sound of many waters. And um, since many waters is not very explicit, since water can be a symbol of many other things, or it could even just be a reference to this, the, the volume of his voice, we can't be too uh, clear on, or, on saying that this means this or that necessarily. He had in his right hand seven stars. We already know the interpretation of that. That's the seven angels to the seven churches. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. We've talked about that. That refers to his word, his sword-like word. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. That's exactly the term that was used to speak of his face at the Mount of Transfiguration. You might recall that when the Synoptic Gospels write about the Transfiguration, uh, Luke chapter 9, Matthew chapter 17, Mark, I think it's also chapter 9 in Mark, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the description includes the statement that his face shone like the sun at noonday. And here we have the same imagery here. What does that refer to? Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, it would seem it referred to his resplendent glory. It may have more meaning than that, but I think it's just the fact that God, uh, that he is God, that he shines with the glory of God. It probably speaks of his deity. In Ecclesiastes 8.1, it says a man's wisdom causes his face to shine. But I'm not sure that that would be connected here necessarily. If so, then the shining face would refer to wisdom. Uh, that's Ecclesiastes 8.1. But I think probably since the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, this is, description was made to speak of his glory being revealed to the disciples. It is simply a, a, a description of a glorious appearance on this occasion. His glory is seen by John here. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That happened also to Daniel when he saw the same person. And he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. Now some commentators, have, in order to show how, how inappropriate it is to take these symbols literally, point out that the right hand had the seven stars in it. And now he, puts, now he lays the hand on John, the same hand. Which, if you followed the image, you know, exactly, would mean that the seven stars must have fallen out of his hand, or else, you know, he, when he put his hand on John, the seven stars must have been pressed up against John, or something like that. I've heard commentators make reference to this in order to show how ridiculous it is to take it literally. I'm, frankly, um, I, I don't tend to take it literally anyway, and I don't think it's necessary to, to point to little details like this to prove it. But, I mean, maybe that is another confirmation. It would seem, if his hand is engaged in, in holding the seven stars, that for him to then turn and take the same hand laid on John would be inconsistent with the vision. But, since it is a vision, I believe, it is an experience John may be having a bodily experience with if he falls on the ground, although he might be just envisioning himself on the ground. It's so difficult when the prophets like Zechariah or Ezekiel or many of the other prophets describe the things that happened to him it's so difficult to know for sure whether they're talking about something that they physically experienced or whether it's something that they saw themselves going through in a vision or what. And the same problem exists here. And I suppose to, to puzzle over to try to answer the question is to probe into areas that God has not chosen to clarify about. 
But his response in seeing this vision of Christ was like that of Daniel. He fell on his face as one dead. Apparently the vision of Christ's glory uh, has this effect. Um, in contrast with certain people I've heard, like Kenneth Hagin, who claim to have see visions of Christ all the time, every once in a while anyway, and have, you know, cordial conversations with him, even arguing with him on occasions, um, one has to wonder, is that the same Christ that John saw that's appearing to this man? Because, I mean, uh, there, I mean, in the descriptions I've heard from Hagen and others, uh, not very many others, but a few who've said they've seen Jesus, it sounds like they're almost chummy. They're all, you know, there's, there doesn't seem to be this sense of majesty and terror in the presence of the glorious resurrected Christ that the disciples always seem to have felt. Uh, even before he was in this form, when he resurrected from the grave and appeared to his disciples in the upper room, and on other occasions, they often were afraid. In fact, his first words to them usually was, don't be afraid. Apparently they were. And here also, the first words he says are, don't be afraid. So apparently, if a person really sees Jesus in his glorified form, their first, their initial reaction is to be afraid. And therefore he has to tell them not to. Uh, it does raise questions, you know, when people claim they've seen Jesus, and yet their reactions were entirely different than this whether it was really Jesus that they saw, or maybe someone disguised as Jesus. In verse 18 it says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Clearly Jesus is the only one who could say that. And uh, I have the keys of Hades and death. Now Hades is, the, the translators in this case have chosen not to translate it, just give it to us in the Greek. Greek, Hades. In the English, sometimes it's translated the grave, sometimes... In the King James especially, it's translated hell. as the keys of hell and, and death. Um, Hades and death are linked also later on. Um, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire in chapter 20 together. It would seem that Hades is simply the place where the dead go or went prior to the time that Jesus rose from the dead. There's not an awful lot of information about this in the Bible, although the word appears a lot of times. It doesn't appear in such a way as to really give us a clear teaching about what Hades is. The most graphic picture of Hades we have in the Bible is from a story Jesus told in Luke chapter 16 about Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man is specifically said to have gone to Hades. Some believe that even Lazarus was in Hades in another compartment of Hades. That's the pretty standard uh, evangelical interpretation of that, that Hades had two compartments. The righteous were in one compartment and the wicked in another. Uh, however, in the, in the story, Jesus only said that the rich man in Hades found himself tormented in flames. Um, whether Lazarus and Abraham and the others in the parable were also in a compartment of Hades uh, is not clearly stated. But it is the view of evangelicals generally that prior to the resurrection of Christ, all persons who died went to Hades. If they were died in faith, they went to Abraham's bosom, where Lazarus went. If they died without faith, they went into flames. Now, at the time that Jesus rose from the dead, according to the standard teaching on this subject, uh, those who were in Abraham's bosom went with Christ back up into heaven. When he ascended, they went with him. It says in Ephesians, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, which might be a reference to those who had been in Hades before, who had died in faith. If that is true, then the scenario we now have since the cross is as follows. If a sinner dies, he goes to Hades still until the time of the judgment. Later on in Revelation 20, we read that death and Hades, and presumably the occupants, are cast into the lake of fire. Uh, however, those who were righteous and who were in Abraham's bosom are now in heaven with Christ since his resurrection and ascension. And if you die, you go to be in, in heaven with Christ and not to Hades. That is... That is at least the teaching you'll get from virtually any evangelical source on the subject, I think. Um, it is not clearly taught in the Bible. There are verses that may hint in that direction, but uh, we don't know enough about it. But we can say this much. Hades is associated with death, whether it's interpreted as the grave, as some understand it, or as a, as a place like Jesus described, or both. It is obviously some, a place where the dead go. And so when he says, I have the keys of Hades and death, it suggests his ability to unlock the door. Now, keys can either allow people in or out. Later on, 
uh, well, no, earlier on, I should say, he told Peter back in Matthew chapter 16, I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And the keys obviously are for the purpose of opening the door to allow people into the kingdom of heaven in that case. Here Jesus says, I have the keys of Hades and of death, presumably to release people from death. He has just finished saying, I was dead, but now I'm alive. In other words, it's a reference to his resurrection. And that means I have the ability to release others from the place I've escaped from too. I, I was swallowed up by death in Hades, but I've broken out of there. I've got keys. I can let you out of there too. So be faithful unto death and don't fear death in Hades because I have the keys and I can release you. And that is the purpose of his saying so. Now, some people frequently say that when Jesus died, he went down into Hades and he got the keys from the devil and he came back and he's got the keys now and so forth. I understand this to be a symbolic statement. It's, uh, it may be that the devil was holding the keys and that Jesus went down and got them from him, but I, I also think that most of this is all just in symbolic language. And to say that a man has the keys to, to Hades and death is no more literal than to say that Peter had the literal keys to the kingdom of God, as if you know he had a key ring with those keys on it. Obviously, it's a symbolic statement, meaning he had the power to open. And therefore, since he is broken out of Hades and death, his followers uh, can be assured that if they die, uh, that he will free them from the same, because he has the keys. He can open for them, too, to let them out. Now, verse 19, he gets specific instructions for the first time. Write the things which you have seen. Uh, well, actually, he was told to write earlier, too, but here he's told specifically what to write. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Now, some of this we've talked about before. The futurist believes that this is the threefold division of the book. The things you have seen is the vision he's just described. The things that are is the church and those things that pertain to the church age. Therefore, they believe that chapter 1 is the things that he has seen. Chapters 2 and 3, which contain the seven letters of the seven churches, contain the things that are. And then the last statement is, and those things that shall be after this, or literally after these things, metatauta, these things, in the Greek. Now, it is important to note that in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, after these things, that is, metatauta, again, the same Greek term. Metatauta, after these things, I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. According to the futurist view, at least that of the dispensationalists, not all futurists are dispensationalists, but according to the dispensational view, this is the rapture of the church. John himself is caught up into heaven, uh, and, and this is a type of his being the rapture of the church. Now, there is a problem with seeing it that way, since John is later seen on earth again, a couple of times, in chapter 11 and chapter 17, so... If his motions between heaven and earth do represent the church, then apparently we'd have to say the church is going to go up and down and up and down and up and down several different times in the course of the outwork into the book of Revelation. Of course, it's absurd to suggest that just because John was caught up that this represents the church being caught up. But the reason that this is argued this way is because of the use of the term metatauta, after these things. Because this is the same expression at the beginning of chapter 4 that is found at the end of 119 where he says, and write the things... That will take place after these things. The pastor I used to sit under frequently said, after what things? The things of the church. So, the things that are, are the things of the church. And the things that will happen after these things are the things that happen after the things of the church. And his view was that the church is raptured before the tribulation. And so, at the rapture, that is the end of the things of the church. And after that... After the church is raptured, the, after these things happens. And he sees that at chapter 4, verse 1. After these things, John's caught up, and then the rest of the book of Revelation has to do with things that are after the church is gone. So they divide the book according to chapter 1, verse 19. Now, actually, verse 19 does make a reasonable good division of the book into three categories. Uh, however, one of the problems with seeing these things as the things of the church is that it's... Um, arbitrary to do so, after these things, after what things? It doesn't specify what things, but it may mean after I finish showing you this vision, I'll show you some other things, and after, you know, write those things down too, uh, or the things that are. Now, the, the thing is here, 
that that last line should be translated from the Greek, things that are about to take place after these things. It doesn't render it that way in the New King James. Anyone have a translation that says it like that? Does the New American Standard say something like that? Okay, does your Greek interlinear give it that way? The end of uh, 119. Almost are, are about to occur. Yeah. Are about to occur. Okay, that's the way it reads in the in the Greek interlinear. The literal Greek is and the things that are about to occur are about to take place. So he's talking about things apparently that are going to happen fairly shortly after the time that the announcement is made. Again, um, used in favor of the preterist view, and it seems to give more weight. This verse seems to give better weight to the preterist view than to the futurist view. And then in verse 20, of course, he gives uh, the explanation of the stars and the, and the lampstands. We don't have to say anything about that because we comment on that first. Now, in chapter 2, we begin the seven letters of the seven churches. There's much to be said about these, uh, both individually and as a group of letters. Uh, the first point I'd like to make is that there is a tendency on the part of some commentators to try to make these churches represent different periods of church history. And they think that by going through these seven letters, we are surveying the 2,000 years of church history. If I can remember the exact dates, I don't have them written down, but I believe they, they would assign the church of Ephesus to the apostolic church of the first century. So that from 30 AD, when Christ established the church, till the death of the last apostle, about 100 AD, they would associate the church of Ephesus with that portion of church history, the apostolic period. Then the church of Smyrna, which is said to suffer persecution, is thought to be represent the next 200 years, from about the year 100 A.D. to about the year 300 A.D., or 303 or thereabouts, when persecution ended. You see, from in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, the church was persecuted repeatedly by Roman emperors. Although, as we saw in our introduction yesterday, um, not quite so much as has traditionally been thought. Traditionally, it's been said that ten emperors persecuted the church, but most of those persecutions were local and or mild. Only a few, about three of the emperors, really were intense and determined in their persecution of the church. Um, nonetheless, persecution at the hands of the Romans uh, was sporadically and occasionally the experience of the church until the rise of Constantine, who I think was in 303 A.D. And Constantine became emperor, and he ended the persecution of the church. But... The Church of Smyrna, therefore, which is uh, a persecuted church, is thought to represent those two centuries, from 100 A.D. to 303 A.D. Then we have the Church of Pergamos, which is thought to represent the imperial church. And by imperial church, we mean the church under the Caesars. When Constantine became emperor uh, and then became a Christian or professed to become a Christian, the church and the state were molded together. We had the beginning of what was called the Holy Roman Empire. There, the distinctions between church and state seemed to dissolve in Europe. And um, therefore the church ceased to be persecuted. It became socially acceptable, even preferable, to be a Christian. Uh, it was advantageous for political advancement and so forth. And therefore the church became somewhat compromised and corrupted. It became married to the world. Some believe that the Church of Pergamos represents that period of time, from about 303 A.D. to perhaps approximately 500 A.D. And then the next church, the Church of Thyatira, is thought to represent the Papal Church, or the Church under the Popes, which is approximately from 500 till about 1500 A.D. This is the way the dispensationalists describe this, uh, this outline. And so they see that as a corrupt church, um, totally compromised. Then, in chapter 3, at the beginning, we have the, the letter to the church of Sardis. They believe that this is the church of the Reformation. Luther, Calvin, those guys. From about the year 1500 till maybe about the year 1700. The Reformers period. Now, both Catholics and Reformed denominations have reason to be insulted by this assessment, of course. Because uh, the Catholic Church under the Popes is thought to be this, this terrible Thyatira Church with its corruption, with the uh, Jezebel and so forth in there. And then the, even the Reformed Church is thought to be the Church of Sardis, about which nothing good is said. 
And then the Church of Philadelphia, the sixth church, is thought to represent what they call the evangelical church. You can tell which, which church these interpreters belong to. And uh, this is a church about which nothing negative is said. And uh, one of the two churches is not told to repent of anything. And uh, from about 1700 to about 1950 are the dates they give for that. From about 1700 to 1950, the evangelical church, the church of world missions, you know, William Carey and the missions movement and the great evangelical revivals and so forth. And this is thought to be the Philadelphia church. And then the church of Laodicea, probably everybody is, uh, has heard someone or, or another say, they're really living in the Laodicean age. Um, boy, this is really the church of Laodicea, you know. Um, that comes from the dispensational assumption that uh, the church of Laodicea represents the apostate church at the end of the world. Of course, you know, uh, dispensationalism has a very negative opinion about how the church is going to turn out. They believe that the church is going to be apostate when Jesus uh, comes to judge the world. And uh, that, that doesn't accord, in my opinion, with what the Bible says elsewhere. But since there is a pessimistic view of the future of the church on the part of dispensationalism, they find Laodicea a good model of the church of the last days. Liberal, apostate, worldly, rich, but forsaken by Christ. Uh, and nothing good is said about the church of Laodicea. So this is the way that they outline the, the church history from, from the apostolic age till the very end of the age. Yes, sir. Just out of curiosity, how did the reformers look upon this? this uh, well, I think they just, uh, that's a good question. The historist, um, uh, well, I'm not sure because, you know, there aren't any actual events taking place there. The events really begin to take place when the visions of chapter 4 and, and following happen. Uh, as I said in my introduction, I, I'm not familiar enough with the historists to give you uh, details about what they think about every passage. I wish I was, and I wish I could. But uh, my suspicion is that these letters would be seen as simply that, letters to these churches. Um, that's what I understand them to be, and I don't know whether the Reformers would have a different opinion on that or not. I know that by the time that things start happening in the book, they begin to identify those with the events of church history, but I don't know that they do that with the letters. I don't know that they don't either. I'm afraid I'm just ignorant about that. Uh, most interpreters who are not dispensationalists just understand them to be letters to churches that existed. Presumably, John was told to send the letter to these churches. They must have existed. And if he really obeyed Christ and sent the letter to them, they must apply to them. You know, These are messages from Jesus to those churches. Um, one of the problems with seeing this as a, as a breakdown of the church history is because almost all of the churches are either promised or threatened that Christ is going to come to them. Of the seven churches, six of them are told to, that he would come to them. It's either as a threat or a promise. And in at least several of these cases, it would appear that it, the second coming is implied, though that's not certain. And sometimes it's, it's just a possibility. You know, if you don't repent, I'll come to you. Uh, the, this provides an interesting place for us to actually look at how the expression, the coming of the Lord, is used in the book of Revelation. Because our tendency, of course, is to always think of the coming of the Lord as the second coming of Christ, but each of the six churches have are told something that has to do with Christ coming to them. The church of Ephesus, for example, in chapter 2, verse 5, is told, Remember, therefore, from which you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, what action is predicted here is not all that clear. He will come to them quickly. Sounds very much like the, some of the closing words of the book. Behold, I come quickly. But this does not appear to be a reference to the second coming of Christ. It's coming to remove the lampstand. As a matter of fact, that church does not exist anymore, so apparently the lampstand has been removed. Whether they failed to heed the warning of this, or whether they did and then later lapsed again into apostasy and he removed the lampstand, I don't know. But whatever was threatened has already happened. And yet the language is, I will come to you quickly. Which sounds an awful lot like, if, if we took that statement in a vacuum, without a context, you'd think that was a statement about the second coming. Um, Pergamus, likewise, in chapter 2 and verse 16 is told, repent, or else I will come to you quickly, there's the same expression, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
Now, once again, there's no certainty at all that this is a reference to the second coming. There's a certain group of people following the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in that church. And he said, I'm going to fight against them, and I'm going to come to your church and fight against them. How? By the word. By the sword out of my mouth. Now, again, I'm not sure of exactly how that found fulfillment. That church no longer exists either. Today. Um, the church of Thyatira, chapter 2 and verse 25, is told, But hold fast what you have until I come. Now, since that's such a general statement, it could be understood to be of the second coming of Christ, and perhaps it is. Although, since the previous two references to his coming to a church may not be, uh, were not, and this one may not be either, I'm not sure. I at least see this as possibly a reference to his coming, his second coming. But he is, you know, the church of Thyatira is told to hold on fast till he comes. Uh, Sardis is told in chapter 3, verse 3, Remember how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, that sounds very much like the second coming of Christ, especially the reference to the thief. Although that church doesn't exist anymore either, so they won't be around when Jesus returns. Um, by the way, of the seven churches, I am told, and I've heard different things about this, but I, some have said there are none of these churches remaining. Uh, one source said that the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of, of Smyrna are the only two churches remaining, that, that there are small congregations in these locations. As a matter of fact, Smyrna is the only city that remains of these seven. Six of these cities are no longer there in Turkey. But but, uh, but Smyrna is. That's what I've read. Now, I, I kind of wish I could have gone to Turkey and looked at these things because I've heard conflicting things about this. I'm sorry I don't have first-hand information, but I'm dependent on what commentators have said. But what I have heard is that Smyrna, which is modern Izmir in, in uh, Turkey, is the only remaining city of the seven, and that there are churches in two of the locations, in Smyrna and in what used to be Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a, a city that was racked with earthquakes, and I, I don't know if that's how it finally fell, but uh, it, it, it suffered a great number of earthquakes in its history. Anyway, those are also the only two churches about which nothing negative is said in these letters, and which the only two churches not told to repent. But um, Sardis, uh, no, we talked about Sardis, uh, Philadelphia is told in chapter 3 and verse 11, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. That sounds very much like what he told to the church um, of Thyatira. Hold fast what you have until I come. Laodicea, there's also a promise of coming there of a different sort. Chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens it, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Obviously not a reference to the second coming. Now here we have, in, seven, in the seven churches, there are six of them that are told to either beware of or are comforted by the promise of his coming to them. In three of those cases, it is possible to see that as the second coming. That is what he said to Thyatira, to Sardis, and to Philadelphia. In all three of those cases, it could be a reference to the second coming. The other three cases, it could not be. At least it does not appear likely that it is. And therefore, we have to realize at the outset that the coming of the Lord in Revelation will not always mean the same thing. There may be times when it does mean the second coming and times when it doesn't. Uh, we just have to judge on the basis of the best evidence within a context on the subject. Now, the seven letters follow a general pattern. And although there's some very few uh, variations in the pattern, all seven follow, for the most part, the following pattern. There are seven elements of each of the letters. Number one, the addressee is named. It's always, to the angel of the church of, then you fill in the blank, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, whatever. To the angel of the church, that's to whom the letter is addressed. Second, Christ describes himself as the sender of the letter. He doesn't give a complete description in any case, but in most cases he borrows the imagery from the vision of chapter 1. For example, 
to Ephesus, he says, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Obviously taken from the vision of chapter 1. To Smyrna, he says, These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Also an echo of chapter 1, the thing that the person there said about that. In Church of Pergamos is told, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. That's also from the vision. In fact, all... Uh, all of the letters at the sec in the second position of the letter have Jesus describing himself. The first five all use images from the vision of chapter 1. For some reason, the last two letters do not. They use other imagery from other places in the Bible. But they all seven have Jesus describe himself as the sender of the letter in the second, as the second feature of each letter. The third feature of each letter is a commendation. He says, he always starts by saying, I know your works. In every case, he says, I know your works, that such and such. He describes their works. In at least five of the seven cases, he has something good to say before he says anything bad. It happens that there are two churches that are an exception to this. Sardis and Laodicea do not receive any commendation. There's nothing good said about them. With the exception that Sardis, near the end of the letter of Sardis, he says, you do have a few names in you who haven't defiled their garments. But, uh, but he doesn't have a commendation for the church in general of Sardis or Laodicea. But all the other churches he does, and in most cases he, he commends churches that he also turns around and says something against. But Jesus is, uh, I guess we could say, diplomatic. If you've got something negative to say to people, it's always nice if you can say something positive first. It sort of affirms that you're not just trying to attack them, for one thing, and it may tend to disarm them to receive your negative criticism. Um, and Jesus does that. He'll, he'll comment positively on the if there's something positive to be said, and there is in five cases out of the seven. The next thing, the fourth thing, is his complaint. After he makes a commendation, he makes a complaint. He usually says, I have a few things against you, or I have something against you, and he tells what it is. Once more, there are two exceptions to this. There are two letters that, where he has no complaint. That is the church of Smyrna, which is the persecuted church, and the church of Philadelphia. The church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia do not receive any complaints. And, unlike the other letters also, they are not commanded to repent. Okay, so he has his commendation, then his complaint, and then the fifth thing is a call to repentance. This, is, this appears in all the letters, except for the two that I mentioned, Smyrna and, and Philadelphia. Therefore, repent, he says. The last two items, numbers six and seven, are in a certain order in the first three letters, and in reverse order in the last four. The reason for this, nobody knows. But uh, <clears throat> number six would be a call to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He says basically the same sentence in each case. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> and then the, the last thing, to him that overcomes such and such. He gives a promise to overcomers. So in the last two positions in the letter, you've got a summons to hear what the Spirit says to the churches and a promise to overcomers. But as I said, they're in that order only in the first three letters. They're in reverse order in the last four. For some reason, he flip-flops the order in the last four letters and you've got the promise to the overcomers before the statement, he that has near to hear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, that is the structure of the letters. They're all going to follow that essential structure. Okay, let's, let's actually look at uh, some of them. We're not going to get through very many. We might only get through Ephesus um, this, this time. But the beginning of chapter 2. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have per per persevered and not, excuse me, have persevered and had patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly 
and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now Ephesus, although it was not the political capital of the region, it was the largest and in many ways the most important city of the province of Asia, which as I told you previously was, is the same as Turkey today. Of these seven churches, Ephesus was the most important and the largest. It had there the temple of Diana, or really more properly called Artemis, temple of Artemis in, our, in the book of Acts, it's called Diana. There was an idol of this goddess and a temple built to her, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. The temple to Artemis in Ephesus was one of the so-called seven wonders of the world. And it was said, it was alleged that this idol had fallen down from heaven. Scholars believe there must have been a meteorite or something that fell down in that city and that it was later carved into an idol and, and therefore it, it had the status of being a heaven-sent image. Uh, whether that's how it happened or not, I don't know. But we do know from the book of Acts that when Paul preached in Ephesus, it was the metal workers who made images. They got very upset by his monotheistic message. And they stood up a huge crowd of Ephesians and said, you know, this Paul, uh, he's going to dishonor our goddess Diana or Artemis. And uh, there was a great crowd. They rushed into the Colosseum or whatever it was called, the, the arena, and they shouted for two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And finally, someone who got up to you know quiet the crowd said, uh, said, listen, we all know that Diana is the great goddess that the whole world worships and that you know her image fell down from heaven here to Ephesus and so forth. So what are you guys so threatened by this new message for? And he dispelled them and said, listen, if you've got any complaints against this man, take him to court. Don't, don't cause a riot because we're in danger of being called in question by the Roman authorities about this outburst, and we don't hardly have any excuse for it. So that's what happened to Paul because of the zealous uh, loyalty to Diana in this city. And the temple to Diana was a very, you know, major piece of architecture. Um, but there's also a major church there because Paul founded the church there. That church later had the personal ministry, not only of Paul, but of uh, Priscilla and Aquila for a while. Apollos came there briefly. Um, John, allegedly, according to tradition, spent his final years there. It was his home church at this particular period of his life. Therefore, the first letter he sends is a letter to his home church. It was from Ephesus that Paul had evangelized most of the rest of Asia, and probably John oversaw the churches of Asia from his home in Ephesus as well. It would make sense. We don't know that to be the case, but if he was the last surviving apostle... Uh, and he lived in Ephesus, no doubt he would have supervision of all the churches in the region, and that would be, no doubt, why Jesus would give him a letter to them. Um, also, of course, we know Timothy was there. After Paul was no longer able to minister there, and, and we don't know exactly what the time period was, but Timothy uh, was positioned to minister in, in Ephesus, and according to church tradition, spent his final years there. So this church had been privileged to have many fine Christian workers. And what is said mainly about them... Uh, what is said in their favor is that their works show tremendous zeal and patience and industry, and they work hard for the Lord. Uh, and one of the things that is in their favor is that they have tested false apostles and found them wanting. They have been intolerant of false teachers and false doctrine. This is what he has to say in their favor. By the way, you might recall that in Acts chapter 20, the apostle Paul called for the elders of the church in Ephesus to come see him in Miletus. And there he gave them his final speech about how he didn't expect he'd ever see them again, and he reminded them uh, to keep the faith and be good elders and so forth. And he said, For I know that among yourselves even there will rise up ravenous wolves, not sparing the flock of God. He says, Watch over the flock, and be careful. Watch out for these false teachers. And apparently the church of Ephesus took him seriously, because here we find later, Jesus sends them a letter commending them that they are intolerant of false teachers and false apostles. By the way, a century later, one of the church fathers named Ignatius wrote a letter which still exists to the church of Ephesus, and he commends them that even at that time, later, they were still zealous for the truth and intolerant of false teaching. So that seems to be the main characteristic of this church, partly because Paul told them to be that way, 
And uh, they were that way when Jesus sent this letter to them, and they were that way later, a uh, century later, when Ignatius wrote to them. Now, although that is a good trait to be intolerant of false teaching, uh, I think you probably know well enough that a person who is committed to being intolerant of false teaching often can slip into the trap of being intolerant of anybody who's imperfect. You know, I mean, you can become very critical and very judgmental to the point where love is no longer the characteristic of your church life. And you're sniffing out heresy so um, continuously and that, that you don't have time to be loving, uh, even to the people that, you know, are hurting or, or you know, even to the false teacher. Uh, in a way, a person who's got false doctrine and may be ignorant and innocently deceived and, you know, out of love for them, you can lead them to truth depending on one's attitude. In this case, the church, for its, in its zeal for truth, had apparently walked away to some extent from love. And that's what Jesus says about them. You have left your first love. It doesn't say you lost it. You left it. It's something you've walked away from. It's something that you have not made a priority. Now, if one would ask, what love does he have in mind? Is he talking about uh, the love they used to have for God? Or does he refer to the love they used to have for each other? I would say you can't, you can't single out one or the other. If you love God, you'll love his kids. And if you don't love God, you can't love his kids because uh, love is the fruit of the Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit brings love up as a characteristic in your life or in your church, love will be seen in your love toward people as well as toward God. And I don't know that I think it would be artificial to try to figure out, is he talking about love for God or love for people? Um, if we were to try to single it out as a reference to love for God, it'd be reminiscent a little bit of Mary and Martha. Here's a church that's very busily doing the work of God, but has stopped loving God sometime back there and didn't even remember and didn't notice that their love has grown cold. Paul said to Timothy, because iniquity shall abound. No, it wasn't Paul. It was Jesus, actually, uh, said this to um, in the Olivet Discourse. He said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. And uh, apparently that had happened here because iniquity abounded. Now, it wasn't because the church succumbed to iniquity, but because the church was on guard against iniquity, because the church was militant against iniquity, its love grew cold. And that, I don't think, should be restricted to love for God. I think it's love for God and love for people both. But it's an ironic thing that people can be untiring in their service to God, like Martha was, and yet not really exhibit much in the way of love for God, or even have much love for God. They can begin to do it because that's the way the religious machinery of their church has been set in motion, and they just, they're, they're on a schedule, and they do it, and they, you know, they do the things that they've always done, and they've gotten sort of into a rut, and they do it the same way all the time, and they know their pat responses, and their pat uh, expectations, and so forth, and they can, they can live out the religious life, although there's no more oil running in the machine to, of love to, to lubricate it and, and, and cause it to run smoothly without grinding. And so the church had left its first love, which is Jesus' complaint. And it was no small complaint, because he says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. As repent of having left your first love and do your first works. Now, the problem was not a shortage of works. They already, he, he says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear uh, those who are false and so forth. And he says, and you persevered and have patience and have labored. It's not a shortage of works. It's just that the works that are of a different character than the works they used to do. They're, they've left their first love, and along with that, their first works. Their former works were works that were wrought through love. Now they're just doing works motivated by some other thing. Uh, motivated by, you know, desire to be, uh, you know, right on, or, or you know, I don't know what, what, what motivation was there. We know what motivation was not. Love was no longer the motivation, but there might be any number of reasons other than love that people do religious things. And he said, well, you need to go back and do the works you used to do, back when you had your first love. Get back and do the first works again. And he threatens them. He says, if you don't, I'll come quickly to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, in view of the fact 
that he identified himself in verse 1 as the one who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Therefore, the lampstands are where Christ is walking, where Christ is dwelling in the midst of his churches. And the threat that I will remove your lampstand from its place means that that church will be taken away from the presence of Christ, or he will no longer walk in their midst. He will not tolerate, he will not dwell in a church that has left its first love for long. Though he has one parting shot that's a positive thing, in verse 6, you have this in your favor, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, it's interesting. They're criticized for leaving their first love, and yet they are commended for having hate of the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which proves that a person can be loving in the sense that Christ requires us to be loving and still have hatred for what is evil. Hatred for evil deeds. Because they have this hatred, and he likes that. He says, you have that going for you. But you've left your first love, and that's not good. So presumably he would prefer that they had their first love and also hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which he himself hates. There are some things Jesus hates. Now, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, there's been many theories about who the Nicolaitans were. They are mentioned again uh, later on in chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, where there are those there who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Is that the right verse? No, it's verse 15. Thus you have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So in Ephesus, there were those who had the deeds of the Nicolaitans. In Pergamos, there were those who had the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But what, what, who are the Nicolaitans? Well, essentially, I'm aware of two theories on this. Um, one theory that I frequently have heard is that it comes from two Greek words, nikos and laos, which means something like domination and laity, or people. Laos is people in the Greek. I forget what nikos means, something like lordship or dominion, I don't recall. But I don't hold this theory either. But the persons who teach it think that Nicolaitans is a compound word that means people who dominate the people. And uh, so a, a number of commentators have suggested that the doctrine of the Nicolaitans is the division of the church into a laity and a clergy. That the clergy are dominating over the laity. And that's the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Well, it's an interesting guess, but uh, I don't believe it's correct. For one thing, uh, we can't prove, for example, that Nicolaitans comes from Nikos and Laos. It could be related to the word, to the name Nicholas. And in fact, many of the early church fathers, some very early church fathers, in commenting on this said that the Nicolaitans were a cult or a group who followed the teachings of one Nicholas. And therefore they're called Nicolaitans. So that the word Nicolaitan doesn't go back to Nikos and Laos, but it goes back to Nicholas. Now, it may interest you to know that the particular Nicholas in view, according to several of the church fathers' testimony, is, was one of the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6 who was chosen. In Acts 6, we have the names of the seven men, including Stephen and Philip, who were chosen to serve as deacons in the early church. And the last on the list is Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And while this may not be uh, true, I mean, we don't know that it's true or false, there is the testimony, a traditional testimony, from some of the earliest sources of church history, that the Nicolaitans were followers of this man, Nicholas, that he had actually become a heretic later, and had become a leader of a Gnostic sort of a cult. Now, the Gnostics, as we know, were somewhat antinomian, they, they tended to believe that you could do anything you want to, you could live anywhere you want to, and you could still be saved. And Nicholas was a proselyte from Antioch, and he may not have been very um, favorable toward Jewish law, and he may have actually gone in the extreme other direction. It's hard to say. But uh, it is interesting that those who have the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in uh, Pergamos uh, you know, their doctrine is not explained, but in the previous verse, chapter 2, verse 14, it talks about people who have the doctrine of Balaam, who put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. 
Well, those are the kinds of things that the, that the uh, antinomian Gnostics taught. You can eat meat sacrificed to idols, you can commit sexual immorality and still be a Christian. And there may be some connection between Nicolaitanism and that. It is uh, something that scholars do not know uh, for sure who the Nicolaitans were, but, but if we would go from the testimony of the earliest church fathers, it would have to be uh, that they were followers of this man, Nicholas. And Jesus hated their ways and their deeds and their doctrines. Verse 7 says, He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I would point out that churches is plural there. He in Ephesus, who has ears to hear, should hear what the Spirit is saying to all the churches, not just to his own church. A lot of churches can become very introverted and be concerned about what's God saying to us? What is God saying to our group? And I suppose it's a fair thing to ask. But it's really valuable for us to hear what God's saying to other groups too. For us to hear what the Spirit's saying to the churches generally uh, around the world or in the area. Just because uh, many times they'll be hearing part of the message that we're not getting. And it's, well, they're more likely to be balanced if a person is listening to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, plural. By the way, the expression, he that has an ear, let him hear, is something that Jesus said a number of times in his earthly ministry and recorded in the Gospels. It was a, a fairly common saying of his. He that has ears, let him hear. Or he that has ears to hear, let him hear. Hear the additional, what the Spirit says to the churches is given. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Just as the descriptions of Christ at the beginning of each letter are usually taken from images of chapter 1, that is the vision that John had in chapter 1, so also the promises to the overcomers are usually images taken from the end of the book of Revelation, the description of the new heavens and the new earth, where you see the, the tree of life is there and the paradise of God. The word paradise um, is, was originally a Persian word. It means a pleasure park. And it came to be applied to a number of places, including heaven in the New Testament. But uh, he is here referring to apparently the new heavens and new earth described in chapters 21 and 22, because there we see the tree of life, uh, a reintroduction of that from the Garden of Eden. Now, whether we're to understand this literally, I, I do believe Genesis is literal when it talks about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But in Revelation, there's such a symbolic element to the book I don't know if we're to understand there's a literal tree that we're going to eat fruit on, although there may be. I do think the tree of life represents eternal life because God said of Adam after he sinned, lest he take of the fruit of the tree of life and eat and live forever. He banished him from the garden. Uh, so the idea was if Adam and Eve ate of the tree of life, they'd live forever. Therefore, the tree of life, whether we understand it to be a literal tree in the new earth or whether it's symbolic for something like so many other things in Revelation are, it must stand for eternal life in either case. And so the promise is to have eternal life in God's paradise to those who overcome. Um, now, it suggests that not everybody in the church is going to overcome. And what constitutes an overcomer? That's a good question. What are they overcoming? Probably overcoming the world. Jesus said to his disciples, have, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. In John 16:33. And in 1 John, John says, Who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So overcoming the world is a concept found in John and in 1 John. However, later in Revelation, chapter 12 and verse 11, it speaks of them overcoming Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony and not loving their lives unto the death. Revelation 12, 11. So it could be the world or the prince of this world, or it could simply mean the sin that Christ has spoken of in the church. The lovelessness is what they have to overcome. And if they will overcome, then they will, they will remain in his company and they will have eternal life in the paradise of God. If they don't, then he will remove their lampstand. And uh, it's a sad thing. If you go to Turkey today, you'll find very few churches there, uh, extremely few. And yet, these, some of these were very major churches in that region at the time when this was written. So a lot of these churches apparently did not heed, or if they did heed, they later lapsed back into some of the same problems, and they don't exist anymore. Sad to say. Well, uh, we don't have any time to go into another letter, so let's stop there, and we'll try to take the remainder of the letters next time.